And it, all the microphones are on. Yep. Turn it on. Ready? I think so. I see it. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and uh, start by calling this meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the El Dorado Hills Community Council. And the first thing we always do is recognize members of our leadership team who are here with us this evening. And I do know, I'm just going to go through the list. It's the top of the agenda. John Vane, you said he could not make it. Have you heard from Richard? No. Okay, I'm not seeing him on there. Chief Lilienthal had another obligation, so I know he's not going to make it. Glenn Krakow, I think, said he would not be able to attend tonight. Sita, uh, not going to be in attendance. John Davey also had another commitment. We picked a bad evening for some of these people. And then Cindy's here. <laughs> so, so that is our leadership team. And with that, um, I'm going to ask for adoption of the agenda. And since it's only you and I, Cindy, unless you have a change, we're going to take the agenda as submitted as the adopted agenda. And that will move us down to the next category. So I want to start by giving a little bit of background on why we're here and how we got here. But I want to start with the county strategic plan. About six years ago, El Dorado County embarked upon creating the first strategic plan for the county. And there was a series of public meetings that were held. There was a lot of participation by various interested parties. And the end result was we ended up defining five elements of the El Dorado County strategic plan. So the first element I'm gonna to talk to is public safety. And public safety obviously is all our law enforcement, our district attorney, our public defender, our probation department, all of those people who affect the legal aspects of, of what happens and the enforcement of laws locally within the county, separate obviously from the CHP, which is California Highway Patrol, and that's, that's separate. So public safety is, is a major part of it. Another major part of the strategic plan is infrastructure. And infrastructure is anything like county buildings, road planning, capital improvements of highways, capital improvements of local roadway circulators, all those kinds of things are in the infrastructure category. So that's where we pick up all of the planning related to facilities and roads. The third element is economic development. The economic development was identified because we had some relatively poor definitions of what the goal of economic development was in the county. And I think in the last five years since I've been on the board, that's gotten a whole lot better in terms of definition and pursuit of economic development. But it's to look at the jobs creation within the local El Dorado County area. And for us, obviously, it's an El Dorado Hills focus. What, what can we do to create good paying local jobs in El Dorado Hills to provide our youth a possibility of employment to stay local, uh, keep them in the community as much as we can. We know that there's always, and Ed Manansala from the Office of Education is here. He knows this much better than I do. I ought to recognize you right up front, Ed. But it comes down to not everybody who goes to high school is college bound, right? There, there's some kids that are just not acclimated towards that higher level of learning, but they need to have good solid training and skill development so they can get a reasonable job and they can have a good life and those kinds of things. So that jobs development within El Dorado County to me is a personal thing of trying to make sure there's opportunities for our youth to be employed and to be you know, providing back to the community their skills without having to leave the community. So that's a key part of it. Um, and we're looking at a lot of different vocational programs to try to help educate the kids that wanna stay here and not go to college. But obviously for the college bound, that, that's what happens. And a lot of what we've seen is they go off to college, they get a job, and maybe they're employed in some kind of a business for 10 to 15 years, and they get to that point that they want to return to El Dorado Hills because they want to raise their family here, where they were raised, right? Because the education, the Oak Ridge High School, and the educational facilities we have are so top-notch, and they want to be back to this community, but they had to go and develop a career, get themselves stabilized, and then they can move back in the community. So a lot of that's what we see happening with middle-aged uh, adults moving back into the community, oftentimes with children, because that's a major reason people want to be, live in El Dorado Hills is because the quality of the education. My hat's off the Office of Education and all of our school districts, because we are award winners in many categories. And so that, that's a tribute to how much effort goes into it. So that was all tied to the economic development piece. Then the other major piece of it is, there's two major pieces. One is good governance. And good governance is about how we, communicate to the public, how we are transparent with information and data, how we assist the public to get services that are needed to help them understand what needs to happen there. So the good governance is 
best practices, if you will, and the way local government operates. Totally different from federal or state government. It's all about local government and how do we create more transparency, more communication, more opportunity for people to learn. Then the last element is healthy communities. And I only put that last because that's what our discussion focuses around this evening is healthy communities. And the healthy communities aspect of the strategic plan was focused to try to look at what can we do to have better communities from the standpoint of public health awareness, recognizing what kind of services are available, recognizing what the importance of good nutrition, recognizing what poverty can do to people in certain areas if they don't have a good food supply. All of those kinds of things go into the healthy communities, as well as the medical services that are provided through our hospitals, through the medical centers, et cetera. So that's what healthy communities is all about. So the community council was reformatted about five years ago when I became supervisor to really focus on those five strategic elements the county had adopted, but to bring it local to Eldorado Hills. How do we relate to those strategic elements in Eldorado Hills? How do we provide input to the county on the things that we think are important, the things that need to change, the things that are new ideas that might come to the surface and, hey, that got this great idea. Great. How do we implement it, right? Those kinds of things. But in addition to that, at the community council level, we added two more elements because I thought that the strategic plan for the county was good, but we needed to add something more local. So one of the elements we added was our Eldorado Hills Area Planning Advisory Committee, which has been in operation since 1983. And their focus has been to look at residential and commercial projects as proponents bring them forward, to look at them from the first community view of what's going on, to be able to shape and form what those developments could be to take a, a concept and say, hey, we kind of like this. We like, we really don't like this over here. This is missing the community element, the community side of it. It can be aesthetic, it can be operational, it can be traffic, but that's what our APAC is currently doing is reviewing a lot of those projects, which is hard work because you get into looking at draft EIRs and thousands of pages some hundreds or th and up to thousands of pages of documents to try to understand what it is that's being proposed and how its impacts are gonna be mitigated. So. That was the piece we added to Eldorado Hills Area Planning Advisory Committee to keep that connected with the community council. And uh, Tim White, who's here with us this evening is one of the vice chairs of, of APAC. And he's also on the fire board. So he has multiple hats like a lot of us do. Uh, and then the last element we decided we needed was more community communications and outreach. How do we better inform people locally of what we're doing and what we're hearing from the community? So. As part of that, we decided to do the monthly community council meetings as opposed to a newsletter. Some of the other supervisors send out a newsletter. I preferred the back and forth. You know, let's get the interaction going that way as opposed to a one-way newsletter and then receiving a bunch of emails. So, because active dialogue to me is a better way to understand things than it is in a back and forth in an email form. So we opened up two social media formats to put our messaging out, one, one of which is a Facebook page, the other is our next door account. So we use that to try to share information from our community council meetings, as well as other things going on in the community we think are important. Things like insurance rates. You know, what, what is our current insurance commissioner, uh, state of California, doing to try to help us with all the fire insurance problems we're having? What, what's happening with the fair plan? How are they changing that? So people can be aware of and informed of things that may be knocking on their door someday when the insurance company says, sorry, but we're canceling your policy. Good luck. And what do you do, right? And I've had any number of friends and neighbors in Elrod Hills have had that situation. So it's that kind of communication that our outreach is trying to do, provide insight, provide information, but also receive back ideas, the things that we need to look at and focus on. So that kind of sets the community council and why we're running this meeting tonight as healthy communities. Because one of the things we had recognized is there's been a lot of divisiveness and a lot of separation of common interests in El Dorado County, El Dorado Hills. And a lot of that's been driven by things going on at the national level, things going on at the local level, COVID, Caldor, you name it. We've had all those things that are conflicting with people's ideas and, and sentiment towards this is something we really should be doing and not this, right? So the Board of Supervisors has dealt with a lot of those things, but we stood back and said, what can we do from a healthy community's perspective to try to reunify our community? What can we do to bring the people of El Dorado Hills together working towards a common project that has common interest and doesn't have political or partisan association with it at all? We arrived at mental health, mental illness, and the way we're trying to address it through various levels today 
and what we can do in the future as a common theme. Because from my perspective, having um, been sitting on our Behavioral Health Commission for a couple of years, and Dr. Clavera is here, and he's probably been on that Behavioral Health Commission, even when it was what, Mental Health Commission? Am I? Yeah, I started attending meetings in 2013. There you go. So almost eight years of, of listening to that, watching what the county is doing, trying to make continuous improvement in the, the programs that we offer, and trying to make sure the budgets are accounted for, all those kinds of good things. So we arrived at mental health. And mental illness is a common thing. We all ought to be able to contribute towards helping, at least in the awareness category. Uh, I've received any number of emails over the last primarily two years of people who are having a lot of angst over various things, whether it's COVID, whether it's getting their kids back in school, whether it's the, the, the inadequacy of remote learning, the kind of stuff I'm sure Ed deals with every day, and those, some of those things are heightened. But we picked mental health because we thought this is something everybody can agree. We need to find a way to do it better. We've had an increase in demand in our mental health services. And Nicole's going to talk to some of those things and some of the county responses. It's been recognized by our youth commission, uh, Oak Ridge High School in particular. And Lauren's going to share with you some of their programs. So it's been recognized in many different levels. And there are a lot of things that have been started. But we want to expand that and encourage other people to get involved. And a lot of that is awareness of what's going on and how you can personally help someone who's in need of those services to, to, to recommend that they get the proper references and, and services available to them. I know the schools have gone to on-site counselors in various cases. So there's a lot of things the school districts have done because of the impact on our youth. And we all know that suicide rates have gone up in almost every category, whether, whether it's youth in high schools, whether, whether it's our military that have been... Uh, basically brought back into society and are suffering from PTSD, wh whatever the case may be, there's any number of things that have had a trauma effect on an individual that they're either getting good, reasonable support and care, clinicians, whatever to support, or they're not. They're getting counseling, they're getting help, or they're not. And it's that or not that the discussion really revolves around. How can we all help get people in need of those services, in touch with those services, and net result is to reduce the crisis management mode that our emergency rooms and our hospitals have to contend with. Because when things really bust, it gets really bad, somebody ends up in an emergency room with some kind of a major issue, or they end up in jail having been arrested by our PERT team or somebody else. So that's the focus of tonight's discussion. It's meant to be informational. It's meant to be a starting point. It's not an end unto itself, but we wanted to just start the dialogue at a higher level and gather ideas and kind of a focus on what would be the next step. Is there a significant next step beyond what we're doing that the public can participate in? So that's the theme of this evening's discussion. Sorry to, to go on rambling so long, but I wanted to make sure the messaging was consistent with, with our goals. And I think we've done that. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, our moderator for the evening. Uh, Stephanie McGann Jansen is here with us. And I'll also mention that there's only a few people here who get employed by the county or otherwise. The rest of us are all volunteers. I'm volunteering my time outside of the supervisor role to make this, but Nicole is an employee of the county. Cindy is an employee of the county. I'm essentially an employee of the county. And the rest of the people here are volunteers. So it's not like the county is paying people to do this. This is in addition to what our normal services are. So I want to make sure that's, that's clear that it's volunteers that are here doing this, it's not a paid for program by the county to promote something, that's not what this is. It's to have an active dialogue of what we can all do to make our healthy community aspect better. What can we do to, to address those things? So with that, I'll introduce Stephanie. She can give kind of a self bio and, and her interest in the discussion. Um, I wanna make sure, can everybody hear me okay online? Josh, can you hear me? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> so. Um, for those of you online and certainly for those of you in the audience, um, I am Stephanie McGann Jansen and I have had a life in politics, actually. Um, better known in the Sacramento region once upon a time for my father who was in politics. Um, I worked for some legislators. I've done campaigns on all levels of government, including presidential. Um, and I was uh, Roger Milo's chief of staff at Sacramento County for 15 years. So I was his political director, media advisor campaign director, chief of staff, all the things, and led him into his um, uh, role in the state assembly, and then ultimately a Senate seat that we did run for 
when Supervisor Cox um, and then Assemblymember Cox passed and um, unsuccessfully, uh, blaze of glory, lost that election. So, so that's a little bit about my background. I moved into consulting where I did public policy consulting on everything from education to energy to everything under the sun, but something that I've been deeply involved in which I think is relevant to this meeting. And this is when the supervisor and I had a conversation. For the last four years, I've been working across the United States with universities, research universities and think tanks on, um, on the impacts today of social media as a form of communication, which is typically short form blurbs and how we communicate with each other. And then of course, oftentimes text messaging. So the nuance of eye contact, of body language, of tone of voice is lost. And when you only have so many characters to communicate in, it typically devolves into what? Fighting. I have watched our community. Uh, by the way, this is true across the United States. So this is not unique to El Dorado County. Um, El Dorado County does have some unique aspects because we have El Dorado Hills, which if you look at the population perspective, because I look at a lot of voting data as well, we have a lot of people from the Bay Area and Southern California who tend to move here because we are still oddly less expensive, than, as expensive as we are, less expensive in those communities. So that's of course changing the way that people vote here. Of course, as we go up the hill and we get more rural, um, the vote tends to be more conservative, which by the way, is fine. So before I read what I actually spent time on as a volunteer doing this for my community because I care about my community, um, I do wanna set the table with this. We have a decision to make as a community, as a county, and it goes like this. Our children are looking to us to set the tone for what future leadership is gonna look like. Our democracy, in right now, we have more Democrats and Republicans than we do have third or fourth parties. So our democracy actually works like this. We have a representative form of government. And that means on all levels of government, we're gonna have some people that represent districts that are pretty liberal, tend to be more coastal, and we're gonna have people that represent very conservative districts that tend to be more rural or inland. That's democracy. So our job as elected officials is to come together to the table and say, we represent these people, we represent these people. Let's find common ground and negotiate to find the best policies we can push forward for everybody. That's our job in a democracy. We do not have an autocracy. We do not have an authoritarian form of government. We have a democracy. And so that's what it looks like. So it's okay that we disagree. In fact, we do, depending on what side of the aisle we're on. But how we disagree and the manner in which we express that disagreement is really what matters. And I would suggest we have a lot of work to do. And I'm hoping as a community, we can unite around that. I have got a dry mouth because I'm on Benadryl right now because I have allergies. So I apologize. <laughs> I wanted to share some thoughts with you that I actually spent a bit of time on because I think this does set the table. We could talk about how we're divided, but I think we need to talk about why, or at least those things that are adding to the divisiveness so that we can start this meeting and hopefully we can move forward in a way that's productive, understand that we see the world differently. And that's okay too, right? It just is interesting. So I will be as, as, as brief as I can. Social media companies, I have a background in tech too, so this is not coming out of totally left field. Social media companies incentivize toxicity with, in some cases, character limits and a clout chasing culture. Quick, clever gotchas are rewarded over long detailed threads. This leads some people to excessively caveat points to avoid misunderstanding and others to care even less. The vast majority of in-person communication is implicit through body language, tone, relationship context, et cetera. All of that is lost online. You might think a post clearly shows your thinking, but someone will always interpret it differently. When people see posts that affirm their biases, by the way, this is both sides of the aisle. I'm not being partisan right now. They often interpret them in the best light, but when they see posts that go against their biases, they often interpret them in the worst of ways. Caveats and context can help, but they only go so far in short form platform. Some people will read into everything you do online based on accounts that you follow, accounts you regularly engage with, or content you've posted in the past in order to infer what your motivations are so they can make a snap judgment. Enter the algorithm, by the way. No one talks, no one takes posts purely at face value. Engaging in hypotheticals or analogies to help, to help illustrate a point is almost always more harmful than helpful because some people will think you mean exact 
one to one comparisons or that you're signaling in a different view. Pub publicly sharing thoughts and ideas through text is a challenge for everyone, even those with experience. Internet culture pressures people to engage others in this unnatural way, often without adequate tools or education. This leads to a downward spiral of communication habits, staying aware of how internet culture incentivizes and amplifies certain behaviors is key to managing them. Be as clear as you can when sharing ideas and consider it when others try to do the same in case it wasn't clear. I'm gonna hit a few topics and then I'm gonna close and let this meeting continue. Here's a friendly reminder in times of uncertainty and misinformation. Now, some of this I wrote back in 2020 at the height of the pandemic, um, as there was a lot of confusion in communication, confusion in facts. Anecdotes are not data. Good data is carefully measured and collected. Information based on a range of subject dependent factors, including but not limited to controlled variables, meta-analysis and randomization. Outliers attempting to counter global consensus around this pandemic, and we're gonna use this as an example because have we not divided over the pandemic? Let's just admit it, it's true. <laughs> With amateur reporting or unverified sourcing are not collecting data. Breaking news stories that only relay initial findings of an event are not collecting data. We have to be careful in our media consumption. It can be difficult to know what to believe in a time when institutional trust is diminished and the gatekeepers of information have been dismantled. But it's more crucial now than ever before to follow a range of credentialed sources for both breaking news and data collection. Here's a caveat. If you find a doctor that you don't agree with or you don't understand or you don't really relate to, you go look for another doctor. You don't go look for a plumber. I'm using that example because I'm trying to explain just as if you found a plumber that didn't do a good job, you wouldn't then go look for a doctor. The doctor probably is not a plumber also. I mean, maybe, that would be amazing. It can be difficult to know what to believe in a time, I think I already read that, as we currently are limited with, and we have evolving metrics that experts are deciphering and acting upon immediately to the best of their ability. This terrain leaves many openings for opportunists and charismatic manipulators to lead people astray by exploiting what they want to hear. Breaking news and storytelling will always be spun with interpretive bias from all different media perspectives. Again, both sides of the aisle. But data is a science that can't be replaced by one-off anecdotes. Try to remember this to avoid fear-based sensationalism or conspiracy theories taking over your thinking. You can maintain independent critical thinking towards institutions without dipping into fringe conspiracies that get jump-started by individual anecdotes being virally spread as data. It's not easy but it's necessary to keep any semblance of responsible online information flow. One major roadblock in getting credible information to the masses is the divide between experts and communicators. Most experts are not communicators. Most communicators aren't experts. This often results in research being spun with a narrative by the time it reaches the public. Research makes descriptive claims while humans draw prescriptive claims from it. These interpretations are often necessary to discover the why and the how, but one fact remains. The experts who do the work itself are the ones with the best interpretation of their own methodology. Since experts are often inadequate communicators, this allows space for anyone with a microphone or a platform to interpret their research however they want and project it to the masses, even if it directly opposes their conclusions. This drives partisan divide as well as fringe conspiracies. There are cases when experts oppose the conclusions of other experts within their specific field. That debate and refining is part of the scientific process. But just because someone is an expert in X doesn't mean they're an expert in Y. And each expert's credentials vary. Many people do seek out fringe dissenters with an expert consensus to reinforce their own biases. And many times those dissenters are not credentialed in the relevant area, meaning one, they're wrong. Two, they are wrong, acting in bad faith. Three, wrong, when we use the term useful idiot, that's kind of a, a funny joke if you have that. I say useful idiot all the time. The vast majority of any population looks to communicators, often entertainers. Now this is all data based on research across the United States and actually globally in this case. Let me say it again. The vast majority of most populations look to communicators, often entertainers, which include anchor men and women, of national news shows for answers. 
Because of this, we need to demand higher standards of our communicators when dealing with expert information, and we also need to encourage our experts to become better communicators. So I'm going to fast forward for those of you that might think this is partisan because it's not. So I'm going to talk about science really quick, and it's not going to be science. Don't think science, pandemic, masks, vaccines, don't get all like, don't, don't get triggered, I promise. We're just talking about science, which applies to social science. It can apply to education, all of it. In science, there are rules, and there are exceptions. Rules provide consensus and patterns, while exceptions provide outliers that challenge us to prove the rules. In hard sciences like physics, a virtual 100% consensus is possible, but in soft sciences like economics, it's never that clean. Because all people are cursed with motivated reasoning, if the scientific rule of a subject challenges their beliefs or desires, they actively seek exceptions to reaffirm them. This is common for all of us. Exceptions can sometimes be proven useful or even correct, but this bias muddies the search for truth. In our recent statements on following consensus and data, not anecdotes and conspiracies, critics add that exceptions do exist. Sometimes conspiracies or fringe experts are proven true. Apologies for lacking more caveats in our message to reestablish trust in truth requires expert um, consensus. So I'm gonna then move, I mean, I could go on. And I know most of you are like, yeah, would you, would you, uh, would you move along? I want to talk really quickly about the Dunning-Kruger effect, because it's something that I think we have all suffered from. It is something that two researchers with the last name Dunning and Kruger studied. And it's become very prevalent in today's world of social media and exposure to disinformation, misinformation, and just an inability to interpret data, regardless of what the discipline is that you're looking at. The Dunning-Kruger effect occurs when people think they are smarter or more competent or more knowledgeable than they actually are leading to blind spots. It doesn't matter how intelligent or self-aware you are, everyone is susceptible. Everyone tends to think of themselves as the most rational moral being. But in reality, if everyone thinks this, not everybody can be right. The problem is, is that people are rarely capable of noticing self-laws or biases on their own. So what I will end with is this. Study ideas and ideologies outside of your confirmation bias so you can see the world through multiple lenses. We learn so much from others when we allow ourselves the opportunity to imagine that maybe we're wrong. So I am going to encourage everybody here to do the following, and I'm hoping we have enough people watching, and I'm hoping we have enough people watching on replay. As an adult, our community deserves the following. So we need to wake up every day and say, if I wake up angry and I wake up ready to fight and I wake up ready to be right and wake up with a complete unwillingness to imagine that maybe I don't know, that's a choice we're making for an unhealthy community. We are deciding we're going to be angry, we're gonna be divided, and we're gonna own that anger as a source of strength. How is that working for us, El Dorado County? I'm gonna argue it's not. We have people this evening who did not attend this meeting because on the face of it, it was partisan. And why would I ever do that? Because we are El Dorado County, that's why. And regardless of what your faith or lack of faith, regardless of what color your skin is, regardless of your socioeconomic status, we are El Dorado County. And this county cannot move forward whether it's a land use decision, park, golf course, we are dying on hills and killing relationships. We are fighting in our own families. I am meeting more people now than not where mothers are no longer talking to their sons and daughters have divorced their dads and grandparents. What are we doing? I would opine this is a choice and we can unchoose this. And I would argue that we should. So for those of you that are listening online, I implore you, this is silly. We have to be able to come together in a democratic form of government to understand that we are represented with different people that have different ideas about right and wrong. And it's getting more complex, more languages, more cultures. What do you want the future of your neighborhoods to look like? And whose responsibility is it? If you walk around devolving and angry and never speaking again, don't worry about golf courses or roads or infrastructures or schools. You'll never get there. 
If we fight about the school because we think it's Republican or Democrat, that school's never gonna get built. We have a choice to make. So tonight I would suggest to you that mental health is our new and next pandemic. And we all have a vested interest in ensuring that we have equal and open access to mental health services regardless of age or socioeconomic status. That was a lot of words and I apologize. But I wanna remind everybody here that we can unchoose to be at the helm of social media silos and start actually showing up and talking to each other. So thank you for your patience in that word salad. <laughs> I hope we have a great meeting tonight. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Stephanie, appreciate that. That kind of sets the framework for the discussion, so that's great. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Yoder and Dr. Josh Elder, who is on the, the Zoom meeting with us. And I'd ask both of them, since they've reflected and shared with me personal experiences and things going on with mental illness, to, to share some of the things they've heard. We've all heard stories, right, about someone in the neighborhood who's had a problem, somebody. But when it hits home is when it's somebody who's a family member and you see one of your grandchildren or you see your nephew or niece kind of go off the deep end because of all the emotional stress they're, they're faced with. And we have a lot of social media for school age kids. It's often bullying and type and that sort of thing. And that creates a mental stress, which can in itself impose a mental illness concept that needs to be dealt with. And counseling is one of the answers to some of those things. But I wanted to ask Jennifer and Josh to share some of their experiences in that regard, because I think hearing some stories once in a while relates to the things that we're aware of or have heard stories in other ways. And I just think it's a good way to get a better perspective on what's going on in our community because there's a lot of things going on and some of them are not very good and we have to find a way to try to turn that around. So let's start with Jennifer, just kind of a self-introduction and then some sharing of, of your thoughts and, and experiences with this. Thank you, John. Um, I'm Jennifer Yoder and I get to follow Stephanie. <laughs> I, I, I don't have that much of a presentation. I don't have slides. What I do have is experience over the last year leading the Colorado Hills Republican women. So I'm kind of a figurehead here. I'm at the table with my supervisor um, and with Josh Elder, who I just met, Dr. Elder, who's the chairman of the Democratic Party. Um, and thank you, John, for bringing us together, um, for realizing that this is a much bigger issue than politics and uh, the arguing that's been going on in our county, as Stephanie pointed out over just about everything you could imagine. Um, and I, you know, I, I've been a part of that. And then I kind of stepped back and said, wow, there's, there's a need to come together. Um, so thank you for bringing me to the table. Um, over the last year also, I personally have dealt with mental illness in my family, um, amplified by COVID of course. Um, our pediatrician told us, you know, there's not really a program in El Dorado County that's achieved the success of this program in Sacramento County. Um, and this was also recommended by our, um, excuse me, the counselor at Oak Ridge. Um, so we ended up commuting for two weeks, you know, with almost 30 miles a day back and forth to get my child in this program because it wasn't available here. So I would like to see a difference made in this county and I cannot wait to hear your presentation. I heard some of it last week at the Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, there needs to be something local we can do better and whether that's public-private partnership. Um, I, I have a friend that's a physician at Marshall and he's seen patients come into the ER that they sometimes don't know what to do with. And there's only two psychiatrists at Marshall Medical Center, um, which baffles me. And I don't know how many are up the hill at Barton, but I think the problems are even worse up there. So, um, and then just one final note. Um, and first of all, I'm also really excited to hear what you have to say, because this young lady goes to school with my daughter and um, she's overseeing some programs there that due to stigmatization of mental health aren't even being utilized, which is heartbreaking. Um, but I went for an eye exam two weeks ago and got to chatting with my doctor because he wanted to know, what do you need your glasses for? And I said, well, I, I do some work on the computer, but I'm also out in the community. And then I happened to mention what I was doing tonight. Um, and he said, wow. I said, well, because I have some experience with it. And he's like, so do I. Well, he ended up sharing with me that his son was the one, and he, he said, I can share this, 
It was the one that jumped off the uh, Rainbow Bridge in Folsom in March of 2021. He lived, spent seven weeks in the hospital recovering. Um, and he'd already previously been diagnosed with mental illness, but again, COVID brought it to a T. Um, and he's now attending an out-of-state program to try and heal his mind now that his body's healed. So there's the recent passing by suicide, you know, taking his own life, Deputy Ramsey. It's heartbreaking to see what's happening in our community. And I really hope that we can come together and work together across the aisle to solve this pressing problem. Thank you, very heartfelt and appreciate that. So, Josh, how about some bio on yourself and then, some, cause you have many, many hats that you wear as well. And then uh, share with us some ideas you have on what you've seen and observed, some stories that, some things you think we can do better as a community. Thanks, John. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, loud and clear. Great. Um, so Supervisor Heidel, thanks for facilitating this conversation. Um, I know that at a time uh, of great desperation in our society, just with everything people have been through, it's neat to see people coming together. Um, you know, I do wear a lot of hats. Um, and so I'm a dad of three young kids, um, an emergency physician uh, that uh, works at UC Davis. I'm a combat vet, Army Reserve officer. Um, and what I see lacking the most in all of those different hats I wear is a, is a sense of cohesion, a sense of uh, people just feeling like they're a part of the same communities that they're always a part of. I think we've become siloed, we've become fragmented and we've become separated. And ultimately we're all Americans first. Um, you know, when I was deployed this past year, I didn't care who you were or where you came from. Um, I cared if you could do your job and if you take care of each other, right? Uh, and that, that starts right here at home. So this is not complicated. It's really just about figuring out what problems exist and figuring them out together. Uh, we might have different vantage points of how to solve those problems, but we really have to start with what are some of the major fundamental problems we're dealing with as a community? And one of those is mental health. Um, I wanna first acknowledge and offer my sympathies, and I know on behalf of all of us, our sympathies and prayers for the family of Austin Ramsey, um, that obviously devastating lost his life uh, recently. Um, and uh, Oak Ridge High School graduate, uh, former Army Ranger combat veteran served in Afghanistan, um, his loss resonates with me and I know for so many of us um, being part one of our own. And when I see mental health and when I see what's gone on the past two years, um, when I'm in the emergency department and I see daily the uptick in suicide attempts, uh, suicide, depression, anxiety, substance use, um, I've never seen anything like this in my career. I've been out of training for 10 years I've worked in LA, the Bay Area, the East Coast, um, back here, military, just all different forms of kind of medicine that you can imagine that exists in our society. And I've never seen anything like it. Um, neither have any of my colleagues. And it is devastating for every population, every age group, um, and it, especially our youth. Um, I know, speaking as a father, just seeing the impact COVID has had on just education and um, our kids having a typical childhood, seeing my, my son go through kindergarten and not really having the same social cohesion and the impact that's had on him and his classmates and just students I see around him and also uh, you know pedi pediatric patients that come to our hospitals um, that sometimes uh, it, it gets that bad. Um, at UC Davis, I also oversee our telemedicine infrastructure for direct-to-consumer telemedicine. And what that means is that uh, patients who have or don't have access to UC Davis Health can access a phone or their computer to, to call a doctor. And one of the most important reasons for that access has been mental health. Um, most psychiatry groups now and big health systems offer telemedicine services to, to see patients um, and the uptick in volume has been unlike anything uh, they have ever seen. And so I love that we're starting this conversation to figure out and to emphasize this is a problem. This is a problem in our community. It's a problem with our families. It's a problem across the nation, but 
it's got to start somewhere to figure out what steps we can start taking uh, to put these pieces together. Um, the last piece I just want to acknowledge is uh, the military piece. You know, when I came home from deployment, um, uh, it was a pretty isolating experience. Um, and we have in our county uh, the highest uh, percent per population of veterans in our county. Um, I think, you know, how we deliver services, there's different groups, there's different populations. Um, but I think a lot of it just boils down to not always depending that the government or that a community group is going to fix this. Oftentimes it starts with ourselves, reaching out, saying hello, seeing how we can help our neighbors. Um, it's time we step outside our homes and stop being siloed. And it's time that we start coming together to forge a better community and a better sense of uh, what our purpose here is in this life and in this community is to be there for each other. Um, and so I look forward to finding ways to do that. And I stand uh, in, in solidarity with those who, who want to do the same. Thanks. Thank you, Josh, great messaging. So with that, I think we're ready to turn to Lauren. And I do want to recognize that Lauren is a sophomore at Oak Ridge High School. You're going to be very impressed with this young lady in terms of her knowledge, her, her motivation, her energy. She's putting into a lot of these things. And she did prepare some PowerPoint slides. So actually, actually, I feel like it'd be better if I didn't do the slides. Really? Yeah. I went through them. I think they're incredible. Okay. You can just like, <laughs> I thought that was just great. So I, I think you need to show your talents and you can talk to them just fine because that will become part of the record if you're okay with that. We yeah. can send it out to people. So if you're if you're comfortable with it. Do you have it on your post it or is it just from the email you sent me? Okay. Okay, well, I'll just introduce myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. Um, I'm a 15 years old. I'm a sophomore at Oak Ridge High School. I'm currently serving as the vice chair for the El Dorado County Youth Commission, and I represent District 1. Um, I'm also a student representative for the Tobacco Usage Prevention Education Oversight Group, and I serve on the Youth Board of Directors for the California Youth Advocacy Network. Um, I kind of get the unique opportunity of being able to attend our local high schools and also be able to see kind of behind the, the scenes, see the efforts that are being put in by administration and by EDCO. Um, so I kind of get a bit of a unique perspective and being able to see that. And also being on leadership at, at Oak Ridge, I also get to see the efforts that are being put in there. So I kind of get to see a little bit of what's happening everywhere and kind of being, getting that perspective. Um, kind of getting in more involved in our community and local governments definitely given me a lot more, um, I have a lot more respect for local government and I really want our students at our high schools to be able to be able to utilize all these resources and to be more aware of all the stuff that we, amazing stuff that we have going on. Um, I'll just get started. Well, yeah, just yeah, go ahead and start. Okay, I'm just, yeah. I think he said, yeah. <laughs> I can just Here get started. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yep. There we go. There's an expansion up there. You can zoom up, right? Yeah, there's increase it. Where's that? Uh, right next to yeah. There we go. All right. All right. Good job. Okay. So, some of the things that the El Dorado County Youth Commission has been doing. So, a little background actually. The El Dorado County Youth Commission is a group of a whole bunch of high schoolers, all from around El Dorado County, representing pretty much all the local high schoolers. We have, I think, right now four from Oak Ridge. So, really good representation for District 1. Um, basically, what we've been working so far right now has been a lot on data collection. We were virtual last year, so there was a lot of conversation about what was going on, trying to recognize what the most focal issues for youth right now are. And the biggest one that we could came, come across was mental health. And I think that was definitely exacerbated by COVID-19, definitely put spotlight with a lot of the depression and the suicides that have been happening. Um, so we as youth recognize that that was the most focal issue we need to be working on. So. We put out a survey last year called the Wellness Survey. We had about 
808 participants, majority of them were Oak Ridge underclassmen. So really great for us in District 1 to be able to kind of look at that specific pool of students. Um, and we wanted to kind of identify what the issues were and be able to also identify solutions to be able to kind of fix some of the problems that are going on with youth and be able to really hear the youth voice and be able to properly present what we felt like we need to do moving forward. Um, we also wanted to compare it with the California Healthy Kids Survey, which was a survey put out statewide to high schoolers all over the state. And because we also had the advantage of having the wellness survey, we could not only see what the issues were statewide, we could also see what was issues countywide. Um, another thing we pushed out for the last few years has been Wellness Week, which is a week coming up actually at the end of this month, which is basically just trying to open up that discussion about mental wellness for our high school students and being able to spread awareness. Uh, the initial idea was kind of to create something like Red Rib Ribbon Week, but specifically for mental health and wellness. Uh, we really wanted students to have the option of being able to see like what the county was doing. We wanted to push out those mental health resources to students. <laughs> Uh, we have a social media campaign. We send out wellness books to elementary schools. We have um, rubber bands that we send out to the high schools that have links to um, mental health resources. It's just sort of a week where we want to really showcase what the county is doing so that students are more aware of what's going on. Um, and then last year, we also put together a skate drive because we noticed that studies show that when students get outside and utilize outdoor parks and skate parks, um, it's first of all, a really great way to be involved in our community and get out in our community, but it's also really great for students' mental health and wellness. And we wanted everyone to be able to um, benefit from that and be able to benefit from, you know, all the, you know, just getting outside. So we wanted even people who wouldn't be able to afford skating products to be able to do that. So we organized um, a drive and were able to donate a whole bunch of products. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so specifically about the wellness survey, <coughs> wanting to break down what was um, most critical for us to improve in our community. And I thought one of the most important questions we had, which was um, what would be most effective in um, improving mental health and wellness resources in our community. And so essentially the type of question was, was like, uh, pick which ones you thought would be most effective. And so our top responses were increased access to school counselors and staff on campus, increased access to wellness centers on campus, and increased access and awareness to youth about community programs. And there's definitely a theme here about how we want students really want to be able to see what's going on because a lot of students are aware that we have resources, but majority of students don't know how to get involved, don't know how to sign up, don't know how to utilize those resources. And especially as a youth and being able to see a lot of my fellow students struggling and really needing those resources and you could absolutely benefit from those resources. It's hard to like see that disconnect happening with so many adults and so many administrators who care so much and so many people of our community who really want to be able to do what's best for our students and so many students that are struggling and seeing that disconnect between why do we have so much resources and so many people that care and things are still not happening and there's still being so many issues. Um, and so the wellness survey was really key to being able to figure out what we need to do better and how we can really hear exactly from our youth what we can be doing better. Um, so from my perspective as a student and also just from being on the youth commission, I think the three key things that really need improvement in our programs is accessibility, awareness, and change stigma. Um, so the first thing, example I would use for accessibility would be our wellness centers. Um, our wellness centers is essentially a place on campus and we have them at every single El Dorado County High School. And this is a place that has uh, access to wellness resources. Um, sometimes I think that there are some professionals there. Um, but the problem that I think that the wellness centers are having right now is a lot of students, first of all, they don't know where they are on campus. Um, and I think it's a little difficult for students to be able to get into a wellness center. I think it's kind of a process to be able to uh, schedule an appointment, be excused from class, be able to get a signed parent document. And so a lot of students aren't utilizing this resources on, resource on campus because of the fact that it's not the most accessible resource to be able to use. And I think it's such an amazing program. And we have a lot of programs like, like this where students are just, I think for teenagers, when things get less easy, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and especially for students struggling with mental health issues, 
over when it becomes more complicated to be able to access these types of wellness resources, it kind of discourages students from utilizing them. Um, even students in leadership, we had a conversation about our wellness centers the other day, and majority of them did not realize we even had one on campus. So that was definitely kind of so hard to hear, especially as a youth commissioner, because the wellness centers are something that we're trying to push really, really hard. Um, also awareness. Um, I think for anyone with a, uh, any parent with a kid knows that a lot of times it's easy to tell your kid something and goes in one ear and goes out the other. And I feel like we really need to make sure we're reaching all these groups of students. And I think there's a difference between telling kids about programs and then making sure that they're gonna look into those programs and are really interested in trying to utilize what we have in our county. Um, another thing is about positivity and making sure that there's a positive conversation and a positive environment around these programs. And I think that has to do a lot with the stigmas around um, any mental health program that goes into our schools. Um, teenagers are really hard to be able to positively have a conversation about mental health or a serious issue like that. But it's really hard to make a mental health a safe conversation and in just in high school in general just trying to positively promote a program like this is really difficult but i think a big part of it is making sure the conversation inside of schools is positive and you know making sure that students understand that reaching out for a mental health resource doesn't make you it shouldn't isolate you it doesn't make you crazy it's normalizing that kind of you know, going to a wellness center, it shouldn't be for someone who's struggling and like, you know, can't handle something by themselves. It's genuinely to improve you and be able to benefit students as much as we possibly can. Um, another thing about, I think the difference between combating mental health for adults and combating mental health for youth has to do a lot with brain development. And just the fact that, you know, because of brain chemistry and hormones and the way that teens are developing, it is a different conversation on how to really attack and be able to, you know, engage with students and be able to improve this conversation and this problem. Um, I think there's the added stress of higher education. There's the added stress of isolation because of COVID. Um, tech addiction, I mean, social media for students is so impactful and so detrimental in so many ways. Um, I think students are very influenced influenced by things that they see on social media and because they don't have the maturity that adults may have they kind of take things very seriously and it's as much of an adult problem that social media is for an adult it's so much of a problem for students and being able to kind of be able to combat that is very difficult um but just in general just the consequences of students struggling with mental health and then in being introduced into adulthood and continuing to struggle with these issues <coughs> It's just detrimental and it's so hard to like be able to fully kind of adjust and be able to create a plan and kind of attack a problem when it's such an ongoing process just continuing to have generations of students where they're struggling with mental health and they don't know how to combat that um so really i feel like the biggest question that becomes is like what do we do next how as from my perspective i feel like the biggest thing is like educating from a younger age. I think spreading awareness about mental health from uh, middle school or even elementary school is really important. I think being able to have kids be able to aware, be aware of how to support their own mental health, um, being aware of the resources that we have in our county from a younger age is really, really important. Um, I think once you reach high school level and the pressures get really, really high and when students kind of lose connection and we can't connect with them and engage with them anymore, that's when the problems happen because once we've kind of, it's harder to stop the problem once it's already started. And I think when we can reach out to students at that younger age is when we're gonna be able to improve a lot from there. Um, also just spreading awareness and accessibility. I think all we have a lot of resources already in place and I think there's always room to grow, always room to improve programs we have, but I think we already have a lot of programs that a lot of students are not utilizing at all. And I think there's a lot of things that students would really benefit from. So definitely wanting to make sure that we're also aware that like, you know, we have a 411 number, but the likelihood of a student calling that is really low. And uh, the likelihood of handing a student a pamphlet and them looking up the website on it is really low. But trying to just, you know, continue to just push for students to use those resources and hope that someone will hear it and someone will try it and start that positive conversation and chain 
um, is definitely something that I hope for. And then just continuing this conversation. I mean, I'm honored to be here to be able to present a youth perspective, but there's so many students that have differing perspectives and really trying to continue conversation and the data collection and trying to make sure that we can reach youth in whatever way possible to be able to benefit that. And then just, just from a youth, from myself, I just am so grateful for all of you for really caring. Um, I know it's hard to hear that all these things that are terrible things that are happening to youth in our community, but really um, just from every youth in the community, I'm sure everyone's so grateful that there are so many people in our community that really care and really want to improve and be able to help youth. I don't think everyone realizes how much behind the scenes happens, but I'm sure that everyone would be very appreciative that you're all here and you all care. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. So, yeah. I think at this point we want to encourage maybe some, some expressions, uh, whether you have a, a comment to make, a question, whatever, for anybody who's spoken. But I do want to give Dr. Manasala a chance to say anything, add anything. He's been very involved with our youth commission for at least the last five years that I've been involved with it. I don't know how far it goes back, but the youth commission is an outstanding resource for El Dorado County to get engagement between our good governance that we do at the county level and what's going on with the high schools in particular, because that's who's represented for the most part is the high schools, continuation schools, et cetera. But it's been a great program. And I think when they started focusing on mental health, probably three years ago, something like that, it, it really, I think, changed the, the awareness of what was going on. It was before COVID that you started really focusing on some of that stuff. And then I think COVID just elevated and heightened almost everything associated with that concern. So, uh, but Ed, do you want to make any comments? You don't have to, but you're, you're, you're welcome to. I mean, Lauren, that was exceptional. Yes, I agree. That was an exceptional presentation, and I think that you capturing uh, just the voices of a under the 18 was kind of an opening of what uh, we see as some of the issues that are taking place to being able to prioritize and make some recommendations from that accessibility to education to the manner in which you articulated it was very thought. I'm just grateful that you're a 10th grader now. <laughs> so like we have you for the next three years. Um, Nicole and I were in a meeting. We're trying to position at minimum for a $2.5 million ask for El Dorado County to increase mental health supports. And I feel like there are some foundational components in your presentation. This is why I drove here. I saw really appreciate the community engaging the topic. It's very real. The stressors are very high for children, youth, families in our community, and we really need to look at this in a real constructive way and, and model a really nice approach to uh, helping us understand the voices of students and some ideas. So uh, it's worth spending all of our time. Again, I'm thankful for the fact that we are facilitating this discussion that's going to be ongoing. We want to see all our students and children here in this cell. Uh, we have so many amazing time. The last thing I'd say is the seniors this year, the class of 2022, if you think about what they experienced in their 10th grade year, in their first year of COVID, having getting pulled out of school midstream, and then having to think that they're going to come back in their junior year with a normal year, mm -hmm. but then we had to start out, you know, um, with distance learning. We've always taken an aggressive approach in Colorado County to look at safe in-person learning, but there was a lot of consequences. And then the seniors this year, again, I mean, in that class are now seniors, and they've had to deal with this difficulty. So, Lauren, I think you're positioning really well right now to sort of take a leadership role with your generation. Again, it's very encouraged. Thank you for letting me share a few thoughts. I'm just encouraged that we're here together. Thank you, Ed. So the other connection I ought to make, I guess, uh, I understand Lauren's on the debate team. And so <laughs> one, one of the things I've had the privilege of being involved with is Oak Ridge High School's Youth in Government Program. And that's where you get into that kind of debating type of process. And it's a great skill set to have. And so I applaud I'm sure it's probably prevalent through the other schools as well, but I've only participated in the Oak Ridge, but I've been very impressed always 
at the level of communication skills, the presentation skills, the thought that goes into those debates, if you will, relative to proposed artificial legislation and stuff. It's really fun to listen to all the goes backs and forth and stuff and be able to, to comment. Here's some areas you might be able to prove on, et cetera. But I think that's the other big tie. It's not only our youth commission, but it's youth and government type of programs that I think that are feeders to what we're trying to accomplish at El Dorado County's good governance session. So all, always very helpful. And I think those connections are important to recognize. So anyone else present here in the audience who would like to offer a comment or ask a question, Steve. My name is Steve Curry. Uh, and I've been at Oak Ridge High School to debate the AC. I've debated the Democrat Party several times. I've actually taught audience class and we did that again there several times. And it's been a real privilege to do that and had hundreds of young people in the cafeteria there to listen to those things. Uh, I also, I don't do Facebook. I don't do any of those kinds of things. I can actually study it and go in and find things that I want to know. And I think for the young people, and this is about young people, you know, I'm 78 years old. I had another 15 years to go in there. I get your cord a little bit better. So sorry. okay, thank you. Um, my point is that finding real information is really, really hard. So, for instance, I go to Kaiser Hospital doctors and all that. Eleven million people use that facility, yet there are no studies on COVID issues. None. I go to a, a Cleveland Clinic study, for instance. And they have done 52,000 people that work for them. They've done the studies on natural immunity and all that kind of thing. So you can find out what these are. But the ones who should be producing these things are not producing them. And it leaves young people, it leaves older people looking at it going, yeah, there's a scam going on here. We just got to figure out what it is. And we have figured out quite a bit of it. And it's not a matter of right and left. It's a matter of life and death. There are people dying. I've had COVID. I know what it is to be sick. My wife had it. She had it for 23 days. I only had it for about eight or nine days. And the help that came from the public health officer was sit around until you're darn near dead, then go to the hospital. I actually got a call from them and I asked the young lady who called me, I said, can you tell me what I should do in the meantime? And in the meantime, I'm taking 10 grams of vit liposphere vitamin C a day. And I, I think I got through it with that kind of help. But there are no therapeutics. To have a disease like this with no therapeutics is just beyond belief because the medical profession, you have one up here, Joshua Elder, who there's no way to hide behind this whole thing and say, I just have no idea what to do. I mean, when you finally come out and say, hey, why don't you take some aspirin? You know, maybe that would be a big help. But my point is that we need studies that really open this up as opposed to having the feeling that we have a government that wants to keep a cap on this that isn't going to give us the, the information that we need in this for this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And Good thank you. The microphone back there. Anybody else choose to comment or add a question at this point? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> at the door. In sales. <laughs> Back to the mental health uh, topic. Um, one challenge I see is institutional memory because uh, there was a coalition years ago that had um, El Dorado Hills Community Vision Corporation. You're familiar with that? You're not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they had a, a mental health program at the schools with the MHSA funding. Um, with interns and um, um, working with uh, Rolling Hills Middle School, Marina Village Middle School, Oak Ridge High School. And um, they had interns and uh, it, was, it was really good, <laughs> I thought, you know. And um, that seems to have got, I'm glad to see some mental health programs, wellness centers continuing. Um, but I feel that one of the challenges is, and I don't have an answer for this, is institutional memory. So that's what I wanted to put forth. Anybody else? I just have a question about the survey. Um, please, please speak into the microphone to help us with that. Your, um, you did a wellness survey. Did you do that for the entire uh, Oak Ridge school? Or I guess it would probably be for your account. 
the county or was it just for your school? Yes, yeah, so we do that to all the high schools in the county, but okay. primarily the all right. And so do you do, you're going to plan to do that like every year or is that like? I think the idea was introduced to last year, but it was really informative. So I think we proposed maybe doing it a couple other times. I was just thinking about the inputs for that, like what we're trying to achieve from that, right? Like if the county is doing this for school owner, we want our database um, and how it could correlate. I'm sure that you would have good ideas for the questions that should be asked to the students, and it sounds like it's probably organic that the, the, the kids, the camp, um, the board maybe just develop those questions. The survey was developed before I joined the board, but I'm pretty sure it was like input by the county and outside sources. Yeah, it just seems like that's such a great opportunity if you've done it once to do it again, but now there's so much learned. I think there's ideas and concepts that we couldn't even have thought about you know, pre-COVID, I mean, maybe some of the people did, but I didn't. Um, and a lot of it is to the point where I think you said the stigma. I think that's going to be the biggest obstacle. Um, I'm doing some very late research on this with counties um, throughout California. And one of the things I found is the stigma, um, people getting services, going to get services. They will don't, they won't do it largely. It depends a lot on ethnicity. There's a whole battery of reasons why they will and will not. So to to have kids go to a wellness center that is known because it's for mental health, maybe what, I mean, and yes, thankfully there's uh, celebrities and larger personalities that are coming out with, you know, their own challenges, which soften that, but to get kids to go to a center on campus that's primarily for mental health, I just, I don't know what the answer is, but I could see that being the primary Problem, whether I know where it's at or not, but to go and access it online might be easier. I don't know. Just ideas. If you look at physical health, you go to that right? I know. You and participate I'm, I'm, in I'm, athletics. I know. And everybody welcomes you to do that. Mental health should be treated the same way. Physical Having, is embraced. Mental yes. health still has a stigma of you're crazy and you can bully for it. We need to overcome that. The way that, right. the way that it's yeah. set to access it. It's a societal. Yeah. I, I have some ideas for you. And that was anybody else comments how about open it up to zoom is there anybody on zoom who would like to raise a question or make a comment at this point no hands up okay all right so we can go back to that at the end but we're kind of doing this in steps so i wanted to have the county's presentation kind of come last because that's kind of the encompassing, well, what's the county been doing and what have we been looking at and what are the new programs, the initiatives, what are the asks for funding to expand our capabilities? And so we've invited uh, Nicole Ibrahimi Nuiken, uh, who's the director of our behavioral health department to share with us what's been going on. And I know Steve knows this very well since he's on the behavioral health commission, but I think it's, it's important to set the, the idea of how many different services the county offers in behavioral health alone, and then there's public health and there's all kinds of other things, but behavioral health is getting a specific focus this year, in my opinion, from the Board of Supervisors, because recognizing what we've experienced in the last 18 months, we got to turn up the game somehow. We have to do a better job of connecting with people who need those services, getting the referrals in place, and really kind of double down our efforts to try to help people before they get into the crisis mode, right? When you get in the crisis mode, everything explodes, including costs. And that doesn't help the county, it doesn't help our hospitals, it doesn't help families. It's the wrong way to approach it. So the idea is recognize it early, get treatment, get help, and avoid that as much as possible. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Nicole to kind of give us some of her background, because I know she started in another county and then recently moved to El Dorado County. So how about some a little bit of bio and then we'll go to your slides. Thank you, Supervisor Haidon. Thank you also. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight following all these great presentations already. Billy uh, really, uh, um, kind of intimidates me, but I, I hope I can do my best. Um, Nicole ebrahimi Nukan, Behavior Health Director here in El Dorado County. As Supervisor Heidel mentioned, um, I uh, have been here now for about a year and a half, uh, so consider myself still new and certainly, certainly learning the community, but I have been in county behavior health for a total of 15 years. Most of that spent in Nevada County, so not very far away, and then a couple of years in Placer County before 
having the opportunity to come here to Alvarado County. Uh, I am very excited uh, to be uh, you know, with my division and, and directing my division. Uh, a lot of work coming here in uh, March of, or April of 2020 when the pandemic was in full force and uh, most of my team, as much as the county staff was teleworking and to get to know a team and get to know people, you spoke about connections. Uh, some of you mentioned connections. I think all of us and certainly I can relate to that struggle with uh, making those connections, which are crucial for our work. But I'm here tonight to kind of talk and, and represent the Behavior Health Division. And I will kind of make sure that I won't spend too much time on my slides. There's probably a lot of information that I may not address, but please don't hesitate to ask questions if you see something later. But I also still do want to leave some room afterwards for more discussion. Um, so again, we are part of the Health and Human Services Agency. Thank you, Cindy. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And something important to remember is that the Behavior Health Department for El Dorado County is part of the system of care. We do not address all, and I speak to behavior health needs because we address both mental health and substance use uh, treatment services needs. And really through the pandemic, Dr. Elder mentioned that too, is that you know we can't lose sight that both people's mental health stability has certainly been impacted of all ages, uh, as well as oftentimes how they then cope and increase substance use. So we wanna make sure that we address both needs. Um, let's go ahead and do the next slide. So as I mentioned that we are part of the system of care, we are operating as the county division for behavior health services under contracts, really not with county funding, but contracts with the state department of healthcare services. So we receive funding through the state for behavior health, mental health and substance use uh, services, predominantly geared toward those individuals in the community that are Medi-Cal beneficiaries and that are eligible for our services. So sometimes you may have heard some of us from the county talk about specialty mental health services. That means that eligibility criteria for mental health services or in substance use, we provide those services for drug medical organized delivery system. And those are the two acronyms, SMHS and, and SUDS, right? Yes, substance that's use, right. Yeah, substance yeah, right. use disorder yeah. services. I like to stay away from the label disorder. I just talk about that we address substance use treatment needs. Yep. So really for behavior health, we have a huge <laughs> array of services. I could spend probably an hour giving you a presentation of all the services that behavior health does. I don't think that would serve us tonight. So I really just want to point out, with those contracts that we have, we focus predominantly on those specialty mental health services, substance use treatment services, which are not teased out on this slide, our psychiatric emergency services, uh, Supervisor Heidel and some of the speakers talked about that people in crisis, there's a crisis line, the 24 seven crisis line, county staff respond to that. If you are really at that level where we want to lay eyes on you and may have determined that you need an inpatient setting or your loved ones need an inpatient setting, that would mean that you would go to one of the hospitals, Barton up in South Lake Tower, Marshall here in this area. And then we would be able to assess and determine and then you, we would follow up with an inpatient setting. And then we also have some funding. One of you here mentioned MHSA, or one of the uh, uh, community speakers here uh, mentioned MHSA funding. So another source that we have of funding and some of that funding is actually allowing us to do that early prevention and intervention services. Uh, and as this uh, slide shows you, we are located both through uh, offices and contracted providers. We have a number of contracted providers, both in the South Lake Tahoe area and in the West Slope area. And again, our, our access line number, that's really something where I want to kind of touch base of some of what the speakers have already said. I think stigma, I really want to echo that. It came across here tonight. We want to, as a community and everybody here in the room, we want to really uh, be active and proactive in minimizing stigma around both mental health and I will always include substance use as well. Um, because that will help hopefully bring down the threshold and bring people into being able to access the services that are available. It is not to say that there are not gaps and we certainly as a community need to continue to build more and, and close that network of system of care. But it starts with having people understand that they can, for example, call the county access line and that can be anybody. And then if that's somebody who we feel, as I mentioned, that threshold for our services is really that higher need, 
but that yeah. access line staff is equipped to walking somebody through, okay, this is, I think, where really your resources are. Let me help you find that number. Let me walk you through what you, where you can get those services. So anybody in the community, make sure you know that access number for anybody of your loved ones. And uh, Why don't you voice it just so, so people may have a hard time reading the slide? Reading that very yeah, good, yes. Yeah, so so it's a 24-7 toll, toll-free access number, which is 1-800-929-1955. And anybody, any time of the day or night can call that number and be walked to whatever that is. And sometimes it's so wonderful because uh, individuals that are in that distress may not be the person right now in that moment to do the best decision to call that number. I just uh, received an email earlier today about a veteran really struggling right now, but there is a loved one involved that is saying, my loved one needs that support. You can be there on that line with your loved one, you, the person you care about. You can call that number and say, you know, I have somebody right here. And then maybe you can be the one that can help. Let me say Joe to then answer that call. Because yes, for adults, we, we for, for the county, ultimately need to be able to talk to that individual. But if you can be that bridge to get the person to make that call or answer those questions, that is where it helps to break down the stigma we can all as a community work together. So this next slide I wanted to just bring up because this kind of shows you a little bit when I speak about system of care. Behavior health is not, as I said before, the only provider in the community. So we sometimes do make referrals because we either find that somebody doesn't meet our eligibility criteria, but we have these partners in the community, or we also certainly for our treatment services often will find somebody who still needs ongoing care but our, our funding and our purpose is to address that high acuity, high needs individual, child, youth, adult, older adult, the whole age uh, span, but still needs support, not our support. And so we would then possibly refer somebody to uh, services out there. So we certainly have the hospital. Somebody mentioned that the hospitals have some behavior health staff, not a whole lot, but some behavior health staff. We certainly have the community health centers. We have this uh, Shingle Springs uh, Health Center. Then I also do please take note and for the community, CalHOPE is a wonderful website and I'll say it also. It's www.calhope, one word, dot org. The state of California basically initiated this around COVID and it started off with being a resource for people that struggle with depression, just feeling so stuck because of COVID. But if you go there now, or if you call the number 833-317-4673, they also provide a lot of support, uh, mental health support, find other resources for you. The website, if you're a website savvy person, our youth, I think probably would love to go to that website. Please check it out. It's a great website. Let's go to the next. Well, NAMI is the other one I know is very yeah. Oh, I'm now. sorry, yes. We yes. need to make sure that we mention them. Thank you very much. They've been going on. For, their, their mission is incredible. So. Yeah, we do. We have a very supportive and very strong NAMI group in uh, El Dorado County. And uh, they partner wonderfully also with us. Um, and then just, I, I mentioned on here on this slide, just a few more national resources. Because again, it's important sometimes, you know, uh, certain groups are feeling more comfortable. Maybe the LGBTQ group group may want to feel comfortable knowing that whoever is going to answer the phone really understands that kind of need and that kind of cult that culture, then here we have specific lines for that. So please take note of these lines. Uh, am I okay not reading all of them? Yeah, no, don't read them okay. all because okay. we'll hand it out. Okay, yeah. great. So please make sure that you're all aware of that. Now, Supervisor Heidel also wanted me to spend a little time in terms of specifically where we are at for the Behavior Health Division. Uh, in, in El Dorado County and, and specifically also driven by COVID to many, <clears throat> in many respects. So what some of you may be aware of is, is that the uh, federal government issued the uh, ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funding, which was distributed across the country and went all the way down to a county level. And each county here in California had a certain amount of funding that was becoming available to address the impact of the pandemic. And the impacts of the pandemic are, are many fold, but one of them certainly was identified to look at how has your community mental health, uh, substance use, uh, treatment needs, how has the community been impacted as such? 
And so one of the things that we uh, brought to the Board of Supervisors last week uh, as part of the Health and Human Services Agency ARPA fund request is a realization, and my following slides will explain that a little further, is where we in Behavior Health, with where we really are, uh, what we have to address is that, as I mentioned before, high acuity, high ends needs crisis, that's our mandate under our contract. If we do anything, that's what we have to address. We have found uh, that we are spending a significant amount of our funding, which is a very complex uh, funding source, but in that level for the adult population that ends up needing to be inpatient in an inpatient setting, and then needs that high level follow-up care in another, not a hospital, but what we call, is a not very nice name, Institute of Mental Disease. Unfortunately, that's the, the name for these the care homes or, or treatment facilities that are like a locked, locked facility. These are very expensive and they're very high cost facilities, which we actually have to pay through what's called a realignment funding part of our funding, which is a limited amount of funding and has to be spread across all of the services that we provide. When COVID hit, we found that many of our inpatient facilities, and that was both on the substance use side as well as on the mental health side, although on the mental health side, it was more impactful. Facilities had to lock down and could not accept individuals that needed to go into their type of facility, which ended up impacting, many of you might know, we have a psychiatric health facility here in El Dorado County. Many people refer to us at the Puff. It's in Placerville. And that's like an inpatient hospital for people that are in crisis and really need a locked facility. Under the Medi-Cal funding, which helps us to pay for those costs, you're only allowed to stay for a certain amount of days. And if you don't meet that high level of acuity, then Medi-Cal says, well, you shouldn't be there anymore, so we're not gonna pay for you. But we needed these individuals to go into an IND because they needed that level of care. They couldn't go because COVID, the facility had to lock down. Really, for lack of better language, our individuals were stuck. So we had to have them stay at the puff because that was the safe place for them. But we had to pay for that all out of our realignment funding. So you can see that a small amount of money now gets spent into these high acuity levels. Um, that's really the, the impact of the pandemic. We were not able to really move people from the IMD as timely as we possibly could because now imagine people that are already struggling with significant mental health issues are now in a locked facility. So you say the general population is impacted by the pandemic and feeling isolated. Imagine yourself being somebody who's struggling with mental health already, and now you have to wear masks in the facility and you have to stay by yourself and you can't go to the group because you have to be six feet apart. So we have people stay even longer. So with that request, with that uh, impact on our budget, we went to the Board of Supervisors and we said, we really want to have a part of the ARPA funding, which for us is $7,264,000 to help us because we see this still being a continued impact that for those individuals that we must provide, we want to provide a safe environment. We don't want the people that need that level of care out on the street for many of them. Many of them do not have a safe home environment or an environment that can really address that kind of treatment need. So we will we foresee that this is still uh, impacting us. We would like part of the ARPA funding to help us with that and be able to continue to address those needs, pay for those needs if need be. And then we wanted a small portion of that funding of those seven million to two hundred sixty-four thousand dollars to also build a larger infrastructure. Uh, we are lacking places for people to be in El Dorado County that are struggling with very significant mental health issues and cannot be in their home environment. We want them to stay here so that when they can be in a safe 24-7 type environment. It doesn't have to be a locked facility, but a safe 24-7 environment. And they can come and we can provide outpatient treatment services. We can, we say the word, wrap around ourselves, we, around these individuals, really build their internal strength but also work with the support system that's hopefully here in the community and then find a way for individuals to go back to their homes. So that funding we've asked for to help us, it also will, and that it goes a little bit more into the youth and the children's services that we have a play, role to play. We certainly provide children and youth services and you might say, well, wait a minute, there's nothing here about children and youth services. Well, what happens if, if we can have this funding to help us with those costs that I just addressed, 
we then have more of that realignment funding that would go here. Now we can free it up and build our outpatient treatment services. So we can look at building even more on the children and new services side outpatient. And that could be possibly even at the schools. Uh, many of our services for children and youth that, that are see receiving our services, we actually don't provide the services in our offices. Our counselors and clinicians go out into the homes, go out sometimes to the school. So that's on that slide. I'm so going, could you, could you yeah. explain a little bit more about the IDA system assessment? Right. We got an awful lot out of that. And this is just a segment of it. But if you could explain it in general. That's to the second the slide because then okay. have the okay. visual. Okay. So let me, let me introduce one other quick thing. And that is the county has a total of $37.5 million of ARPA funds. So when you see this $7 million ask, you're talking 20% of the total funding that the county has received in two different payments and coming from the federal government. So it's a significant investment. if. If this part of it gets funded, right? And there's a lot of competing funds, and that's the problem with, with all of these things. There's a lot of good causes, but I can tell you personally, the Board of Supervisors, I think, is fully backing this request. We'll determine where that ends up, and we really start allocating those ARPA funds. But it's been recognized the, the significance of this and the need for it, as opposed to other acts that are throughout the community by the hospitals and every other organization, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. But, Unfortunately, we only got 37 and a half million. So <laughs> it sounds so much, but, but, yeah, but it's been fast. It's it is yeah, right. fast. Yep. So what Supervisor Heidel was yes. mentioning is we can look at it a little bit here at this second slide, but background information. So the county actually invested in getting a consultant specifically to review the behavior health uh, division and its services to look at is it working well or where could it improve? So they contracted with a, um, a consultant, Nancy Callahan, her company is IDEA Consulting. And she's actually spent uh, consulting, you're nodding, you heard her name before I'm thinking, Absolutely. many, many counties. She has a wealth of experience looking at behavior health services. She, she continues to consult and, and serve other counties and, and advising them in, in the behavior health divisions. That happened mostly last year, Nancy. Um, and actually I was, because I started with the, uh, the county, I was uh, very fortunate to partner with her. She interviewed over 50 individuals, community partners. She talked to Edmund Ansala, she talked to our contract providers, she talked to Bart and Marshall, many entities. And really in a nutshell, long, long, long uh, um, assessment out there that that's actually was attached uh, to, I believe the board, well, the, the presentation was uh, attached to one of the board uh, items when we came and presented. Right. But I think 120 plus pages of an assessment and recommendation. This is a nutshell kind of of what she found. She found that, and, and you actually blocked a little bit there by, by, by can we move Joshua's? Um, name up there somehow because it's really these two visuals that are nice to see right now what she showed us is that that is the actual piece and as you can see down there under the actual slide that that pink 28 percent is spent on inpatient funding right so we're spending about a little bit more than half of our budget on outpatient we're spending seven percent of what's called residential treatment and board that's kind of that local build the local infrastructure when people still need that 24 7 safe environment <laughs> And the county, we are currently spending 28% at that high cost inpatient uh, level and 10%, even that's red because that's where we are spending all of the money realignment that really needs to be available to do all sorts of stuff and not just pay for inpatient. And then we have 1%, there's something called like a state hospital for really long term very acute individuals that need to be in a very locked and safe facility, but we only have 1%. What you can't see right now, but I'll tell you is under the optimal, what's different is, is that we want to spend, you can see 70% in outpatient. So a healthy behavior health division is much more robust than the outpatient services, stronger in their 24 seven <coughs> residential treatment care, 15% versus what we do currently 7%. And the big difference is you can still see that that's good is the inpatient where we are at 28%. Now this was fiscal year 1920, I should say, but it hasn't changed much. And we should really be at 9%. You wanna see a pyramid, the higher you go in high costs, the lower you want. So this is what Supervisor Heidel references because the uh, assessment and recommendations from, from uh, uh, Nancy Kellen and her organization is really build that local infrastructure, have 24 seven supported housing, different types available for your community 
So when you have individuals that need a locked facility, hopefully they can be here at the park. Sometimes when people present with physical health care, medical compromised uh, presentations, they can't go to the park because it's not a hospital, right? It doesn't have that physical health care component. So then they have to go to another hospital. But if they can be here in the community at the park, have them step down into the community. Don't have them go to Sacramento to a place there. They want me to be here with us. So, so uh, build the infrastructure, reduce your cost. If you have it available, then you're gonna reduce your inpatient and IMD MHRC costs, and you're gonna be a much more robust um, system. So let's just quickly go to the next slide is another comparison of just look at that again. It's, you know, we wanna be on the others on the left-hand side. We wanna do, yes, we wanna do state hospitals. We wanna do a little bit of psychiatric health facility, some inpatient, but then we wanna do the big one, the inpatient crisis residential. That's our 24 seven type facilities. They're gonna be local. We wanna maybe have a crisis respite facility. We want to have we already have currently a transition from a current ARF contract that needed to close, but we're bringing a new provider in for adult residential. We want those board and care facility transitional housings, and then we really want to be able to provide those outpatient treatment services here in the community. So I think I'll just, that's my last slide. I'll end right there. When the time. Can you go back one slide? One of the things I want to emphasize is some of, some of the comparison, because you kind of touched on it, but I think these are important things to get sure. on the other side of the slide, right? Right, so IDEA came back with too many in crisis. Optimally, you have 15% of that population you're dealing in crisis. We have 39%. So clearly, that's where we need to start making a difference. How do we keep people from getting to that crisis mode, which is the early intervention, the early awareness, the, the support to bring down the stigma, all of those kinds of things. And that's where I think we can all participate at some level is to try to encourage people to get treatment, get support, get help. And if whether whether you're it's a family member or a close friend or just somebody you met yesterday that is in need, offer to be able to help them get in contact with some of the referral members you had. Because sometimes people don't want to make the call by themselves. If somebody yes. else is sitting yes. there with them, yes. they feel a lot more confident in making the call because it, it's a participation as opposed to I'm doing it all on my own and I don't feel good about this, right? I don't feel comfortable, whatever it is. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, within this funding, um, is there room for community outreach and education around these programs? So we do some of that, not so much in the, the realignment, but the MHSA funding right. does allow us. So some of the things that we do is, for example, we uh, provide a mental health first aid class, mm -hmm. um, which is a great opportunity mm -hmm. for anybody in the community uh, to, to, to learn about mm -hmm. how to recognize some signs, how to talk right. about mental health, because I think that's part of that breaking down the stigma is that sometimes we don't even know how to... How do I have that conversation? You know, maybe it's it's a neighbor or not so much my loved one, and I am concerned, but I don't quite know how to start that conversation. Yeah. So we're doing some of that through our Mental Health Services Act funding. Okay. Yep. yep, yep. But that doesn't mean that we can't always look at, you know, because I was really struck by something that you said, which was that the wellness centers are not that well known, right, for the youth. So that's certainly, I certainly made a note for myself to really, <laughs> That's something that we want to do. We want to make sure that, at minimum, everybody knows about where to go, right? That's that's so important. And then the other piece is, the other thought I had when I was listening to one of the earlier speakers is, yes, please, you know, take it back to your families, take it back to your to your you know networks. Talk about how okay it is to struggle with mental health. You know, teach your kids, you know, from early on that that's all right. You know, that's part of being a human being. And if you really have a hard time, and if maybe I am not quite sure how to help you, let's find somebody we can talk to. Let's do it together. Yeah. Very good. Um, the other connection I'm thinking that we should probably make is with respect to... Um, It's with respect to the ongoing efforts that the county has to develop the innovative programs, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are new. Mm -hmm. And there's certain funding available through, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's MHA set funding yep. for innovative programs. Yep. It's really tough to be innovative, but that's where the creativity comes. When you recognize yep. there's a need there that's not being met, yep. 
how do you come up with a creative solution? Because there is unique funding for some of those things. The sustainability of it is a little bit more difficult, yeah. but I'll tie that in with our hub system because that's the other part of this. Each one of our county libraries, and there's a county library in each district, five, five libraries, mm -hmm. has the ability not only to teach kids, you know, the educational formats, that sort of thing, read books and stuff, but also to address where are we seeing people in need of services that may be struggling from mental health. It may not be the kid, it may be an adult that's there, whatever it is, but that early recognition and trying to determine how do we intervene and help that, that individual, that's part of the hubs. But I think these innovative programs is another major part of that. So we're not confined in what we can, in terms of what we can do, right? If somebody comes up with some brilliant new idea that hasn't been considered, yeah. we gotta all listen and see if that's a turning point because yeah. it can make a difference. So I want to pitch for absolutely what you just addressed, which is innovation or even beyond innovation, just input, community input, community saying, you know, this is what we need and community needs any one of you. So we have a behavior health commission uh, that meets once a month and Dr. Clavier has been a steady member, as you, as you said, we welcome anybody to join us and, and, and join the meeting and speak up and, and, and say, you know, I don't see that you're doing this. You know, who's doing this? Why are you not doing this? Let's, let's bring it to the table. Let's talk about it. Uh, so join us and, uh, and also, you know, join us as a commissioner. We always are looking for, for regular commission members. Uh, the other process is through Mental Health Services Act funding, MHSA. So that is funding that's available to the county. Uh, and it actually is mandated to be governed or driven by community input. So what each county needs to do for the Mental Health Services Act funding is to establish a three-year plan. But each plan, each three-year plan gets, has an annual review and we bring it back to the community. And then there is a community planning process every year where there's input and we're just about to enter that. And so we're organizing different meetings. Some of them are going to be virtual again, but we're looking at how to make sure that we can engage. So please, you know, uh, look at our website at the Eldorado County uh, website for the behavior health. The information will be out there, will be posted when we have it and come and participate in our meetings because that's what makes us strong. Now, MHSA is broken out into different kind of programs. I won't get on all the yeah. details because I can, again, do a presentation Very for another hour, works, but yeah. it has actually in and of itself, besides having this yearly annual community input where we hear from the community, this is missing. Then it has actually also an innovation project that we will actually look again next year because currently we're finishing up our innovation project. So we have even further ability within that to try something completely new. So if it's an idea where we say, well, maybe we're expanding services over here to address that need, it wouldn't be an innovation. But if it's something that we really truly are doing it in our community, we can do innovation projects. And it can be programmatic, access to services, any challenge or barriers. It can be solutions, all around mental health right. services, but yep, it can be really, absolutely, yep. We can be very creative. Now, there is a process for getting it accepted. Of course. It's not just the county making that determination. Right. We have right. to take it to an uh, oversight commission, but yes, <clears throat> absolutely. It sounds like it could be interesting with the work you're doing at Oak Ridge to understand what some of those obvious barriers are. Like you identified mm -hmm. some barriers immediately relative to what's happening on the campus. Um, and knowing the stigma underlies that for both youth and adults um, across the board. But it would be interesting to understand through your expertise, yeah. what barriers you perceive in terms of access, education, awareness, et cetera, combined with some of your thoughts as well. And I think coming up with some ideas for Eldorado County to serve a variety of ages um, um, could be an interesting project. So that's great. Yeah. Great future. Let's go to questions or comments. Yes, please. Have you got the microphone there? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, the thirty-nine percent. I think it, it, great increase. Yeah. The demographics of that thirty-nine percent. Do you know, like, if it's if it is youth versus elderly, or what it's does that audience look like? Yeah, it's really spread across the age. Yeah, it's not heavily in one area. <laughs> now, clearly, you know, so we have age, but we also certainly look at ethnicity. So, you know, we obviously, for the population in the county, we predominantly serve, you know, the Caucasian population. We don't have a whole large group of minorities, uh, ethnic minorities that we have in our system of care. So, yeah, it's, it's not uh, any particular age group. When you saw that increase, you saw it blanketed across the demographic, not specifically. I would think even the programs that you're talking about, um, 
and do those pro programs match up with the um, the number that you with just the, mentioned with, with that 39% of the people that are reaching out for more services? Well, the crisis portion of it. Crisis right. One crisis. right, yeah, so the crisis services, um, you know, what those numbers and those increases are, are basically the requests or the, the voicing of the crisis. They don't always then necessarily uh, mean that somebody needs to be in an inpatient facility. But it is really across the board, you know, we've certainly seen that. And it's, it's really not, we, we personally he, or here in El Dorado County have cannot say that it's particularly used the heaviest or in the adult. It's really across the age spectrum, yeah. So I'd refer you to the IDA report, which is out on the county website. I think it's on the website. It is, yeah, it is. Yeah. Because it, it gives you all those statistics yeah. and, and where they're coming from and how big a survey it comes from. But I, I felt very good that we were able to get a very capable, qualified consultant to come mm -hmm. in and give us this fresh look, right? It's an independent third party. What are you doing well? What are you not do, doing so well? Where do you reshape what you're doing to make the services better? And I think that was the message that came back to a lot of us. We have a lot of work to do. A lot of these things don't happen quickly. They, they evolve and it takes time. You have to focus on priorities. But I think that that snapshot of where we are and where we need to go is very helpful in terms of direction. We probably need to do it a couple, couple years down the road again, yep. <clears throat> just to revisit and be able to define, here's where we've made major progress. And here's where we've just not quite got the program together yet, right? But it's that honesty, it's that transparency of where we are in trying to accomplish it that makes a difference so any other comments yeah get steve back there yep oh. nicole i got a question for uh do you have a definition for a successful treatment of somebody so for instance is it somebody who's come into the program if you will and been involved with with the healing process for a period of two or three years and now they're out and they're working and they're quote healthy again. Is there a time definition for that? And if we go back to the 10 year period from 2010 to 2019, do you have data on how successful your department has been to get people healthy again? So we do have a definition. And what I will strongly say is it actually is a definition that is driven by the individual. Because we do have individuals that will very likely need our support for the remainder of, of their life. We have individuals um, that present with such significant mental health disorders that require treatment, that require psychiatric medication management. And so success is in that situation is defined. And that can even be at some situations, a youth that comes to us maybe later in their youth life. You know, we have those early psychosis presentations that tend to happen somewhere around 17 and up um, where we will have somebody who in some form or fashion will always be involved in our specialty mental health services system of care. And success is finding stability because we really live in a world of recovery and recovery does not mean that like in physical health care when I have a broken leg my leg gets healed and I'm good to go back on the ski slopes and I don't have to worry about it in our world recovery means that means that you learn skills you you have get the help to build a support system around you because we really need that support system and then there's stability and then there's times when things get really rough again. Something gets triggered, something pandemic happens, and I'm now already struggling with, and now that on top of it, it's going to be really acute. And success means that we can maintain you. We can somehow add those additional services, and then we go back into that success. And then we have also other success stories where we do short-term treatment, where we have somebody come in and they're really acutely struggling, and let me let me give you an adult who maybe wasn't in the system be, in our system before but now really presents with our needs we find that stabilization that skill set that support system maybe medication management and that person goes back has enough has has finds employment and is self-sufficient fine it's really a unique story for each individual so you track the, the 
I know what you're saying, and actually that will go. If you remember, that's where Nancy talked to us. Yes. Much need for us to improve upon. I will readily admit that. My system, we need to get better at doing outcome measures because you can. You can do the overall outcome measures, and there's tools for us to do that. And we apply tools, but we don't yet really do well than looking at the data and bringing it together and building decisions on that. So absolutely, that is yet to come for us to get better. Yeah. It's not like you can run an x-ray and say, hey, your bones are all healed. You can nope. go back on the ski. So it doesn't quite work that yeah. easily, yeah. right? Yes. So, okay, the easy answer is they're alive. Thank you. Yes. Yes, okay. sometimes that's, that's the success. Totally. But then sometimes you feel like they're just still hanging on right. by that rope. Yeah. So. Sometimes there's the it seems to be just, and that's success if we can maintain that connection. And that's sometimes really difficult. And that's where we need that support system. Because needless to say, if I'm the person right now who's struggling so much, for me to maintain that connection is probably the least that I can, right? So we as providers need that support system around them to help us stay connected. Yeah. Yeah. None of us is an island. We can't do it by ourselves. Yeah. Kim. Yeah, uh, John, uh, I want to thank all the speakers. You really were terrific. Um, you know, this is not a political issue. It's a human issue. And as you, as a board of supervisors, takes that $36 million that the feds are going to give to the county or have given to the county and decide how to um, divide it up, you know, I think we can all in the room and say, give the full $7,256,000, I think, if I got the numbers right, to this program, because this is the type of program that has been underfunded for years. It has always been underfunded. It, in any economic downturn, it will almost always be one of the ones that's cut first at the time when it's probably most needed. So this might be a one-time shot in the arm, and I hope you and your four colleagues on the board will recognize the severity. I, I know you do, but I hope you will recognize that and put action behind your recognition and grant them the full money. So. The part you didn't see was the cover. part is how do you get the most bang for your buck so to speak because a lot of this stuff has trickle down we look at the homeless situation and i can see all kinds of benefits from having a, an improved mental health services model right that, that not only deals with the average person who's having but our homeless are having a lot of mental illness too and that's where you get into substance abuse or use that so at some point these things are very connected but yeah we can, tend to treat them as separate isolated islands of of issues that we have to deal with. And, but the common denominator in a lot of them is mental health. If you, and good mental health, you have a really good opportunity to make something of your life, right? To have a purposeful life, to feel like you're contributing, to feel like you're part of a community of some kind. But if you're struggling with severe mental illness at any level, that's a tough thing to do. And maybe it's, it's temporary. Maybe it's a temporal situation that it's puberty and you're going through all these hormone shifts and everything's kind of off and you're under a lot of stress and then you get past that and things are stable and you're fine, but not for everybody, right? It, it, that isn't, it, it, no one person will experience the same trip or the same experience with mental health services as another person. There's similarities, but they're all individual paths, individual experiences. And that's what's so tough about this. It's not, it's not like the physical health, all the emergency room doctors know what to do, right? You take an x-ray, you run a PET scan, you, you do something or you analyze what the problem is. You put the treatment in place, you come back and verify the treatment's been successful with high degree of, of accuracy, right? And, and you're done. Mental illness is not, I wish it was that simple, but it just isn't yet. Hopefully we'll get to that point. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there technology-wise that may help us. My wife is a big fan of med beds <laughs> and how that's going to cure a lot of things, both physical health and mental health. So I hope that is a future technology that, that we bring in and all those kinds of things. But until it's been developed and really demonstrated, you can't count on it. You have to keep doing the best thing you can with today's programs and not something that may come forward, you know, five years or 10 years. You can hope for it, but yeah. don't rely on it. You better better not sit on your laurel. Go after the stuff you can go after. So. Other, yeah, Marie. I feel like this is an awkward question in that here we are in El Dorado Hills and 
I think the perspective down here is very different than up there on lots of issues. And down here, the perspective between two sides also is very, very awkward. So I'm not sure how to ask this, but okay. Is there an income test for these services? And if there is, how are we going, how are you reaching the people here, in, down here, where we've got this huge concentration of population? And honestly, there's, I have a sense that there are a lot of people who don't really care because this issue affects other people and that homelessness is a choice, that substance abuse is a choice and that we don't need to provide services because somebody else will provide services. I'm not making this up. I don't feel like- You're, 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 make, you're making a point about the, the political part of this and the concern that this might not happen because there are people who think this is an other um, Right, and then, and then from an income perspective, of course, Medi-Cal and other services be, be very, there are- For our qualifying income level. So well, it makes me, you know, I mean, right, right. we don't know what's happening to our neighbors. I mean, people could be in terrible straits and we wouldn't know. We don't know how they manage their car payments or whatever. And then I'm, I'm going, gee, these last 18 months have been horrible. Do I need help? Should I call that number? Or am I expected to, you know, have my insurance carrier pick it up. So that is the dilemma. Just for what you, your last comment, unfortunately, in, in our healthcare world is who you receive services through is predominantly driven by who you get your health insurance through, right? So, um, and, and yeah, that's, that's why I need to make sure that the audience here today and enlarge the community understands I'm invested in making sure that we have a system of care available in El Dorado County that addresses everybody, the whole community needs. My division is predominantly geared towards providing services to those that are insured through Medi-Cal. That is the reality. So that means that if you were to call that access number, we, that person who would talk to you would eventually find that conversation to say, and who is your insurance carrier? And let me help you find that number because I think you could benefit from talking to somebody, right? So that piece is, is unfortunately a piece of the reality. But I do think that the more we can really look at all of us, you know, as you remember the slide where we had Marshall and Barton in the Eldorado Hills Community Center, you know, all of us together as that network of system of care, if we really look at building that, we won't overcome that hurdle, but at least there always is a resource available, regardless who, for example, calls that 1-800 access number that I said, right? Um, that's important. Um, I, you know, I think, the reality is oftentimes we tend to think maybe as communities, well, that's really not us, you know, that's, that's up there. I think that's a mistake. I would like to say to that community, think about it. Think about it, you know, this has been impacting all of us. If, if not already before, people in your neighborhood were struggling with stressors that resulted in too much substance use, in mental health, not being well. Um, now, after the year and a half, almost two years now, going on two years in this pandemic, yes, it is. It's, it's, it is next door and it is in your family. Let's talk about that. It's okay, right? The issue is about being able to say, that's perfectly okay, right? And so how can I come up with some ideas to help you? and getting healthier, feeling better, feeling more optimistic. John, I was hoping to make a few comments about yeah, uh, yeah, please, question and yeah. your comments. Yeah. Um, so one aspect of all of this conversation has really come back to cohesion, right? Um, we know mental health is impacted by elements of cohesion. There's great data on this, great studies on this. 
Um, and my question to everyone in this room is how cohesive do we feel as a county, as a community? And if you don't think that's impacting mental health, then go online and check the studies and talk to any mental health professional and they're gonna say that's the case. Second point, along the lines of why this investment is needed, right? When we talk about common defense, no one in this room is probably gonna question why I need to put a uniform on or why a police officer needs to put a uniform on or why we need firefighters. I'd say that to not have a common domain of mental health infrastructure fits into that domain of a community resource we all need to have because I don't know a family that isn't impacted by this. I don't know a community that isn't impacted by this. And I'd say from the cost standpoint, if you want to depend on me as the emergency doc to see you or see your family member and not have these mental health services established, I'll tell you when I see that person, I see them at a far end spectrum, a much more expensive spectrum, a overdose, a attempted suicide, a lost job, a lost marriage. Um, all those things show up to my desk. Um, I don't want them to. I'd rather people have the support and resources they need and the community conversation around recognizing this as an issue that affects all of us. It could affect me, it could affect John, it could affect anyone in this room. And so it shouldn't be predicated on our ability to have insurance. It's a community aspect that if not, if we don't have access to, it'll end up impacting us in, in other ways. Um, and so when I see the level of violence in our, in, that comes through Sacramento or the level of mental health illness, um, we gotta invest in this. Mental health is, is just so critical to, uh, to us functioning and cohesion is obviously so tied to that. So I loved you know, Stephanie's and uh, you know, comments at the beginning of this, around, you know, independent of your political uh, disposition, um, finding ways to be cohesive is, is really important to our mental health. And I think that it starts there. And so I'm glad that tonight we've had this conversation as hopefully an awakening to mental health being a priority, cohesion being a priority, and not doing something not being the solution. Thank you, Josh, and we're not certain if this is going to shut off at eight o'clock, so I do want to let people know that we will be sending out emails with follow up information and stuff. But hopefully, it'll be able to continue. And I would like to turn to we have one Zoom participant who's got her hand up, wants to raise a Mary. question or have a comment. So, Mary, go ahead. Yes, um, I have a specific question. Uh, our county recently experienced uh, the tragedy of the Caldor fire. And as a result of that fire, an entire community was displaced. This was an extremely traumatic uh, event. The people that lost their homes and their community are suffering. The students that are in the that lost their school, Walt Tyler School, are, um, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for each individual, but I am certain that, that they are having a difficult time adjusting. They've lost their home, they've lost their neighbors, and now they're in a different situation. This has got to be a stressful mental health situation for all of those people. And my question is, what is the county doing to reach out to the victims of the Calder fire? So we have actually within um, the county operations, our emergency operations center is converted basically to providing outreach services to all of the Caldor fire victims. And there's been a number of different facilities and briefings and other things set up. Part of that is to, do to deal with the trauma associated with it. So I know, I'm not sure if, if Nicole has been pulled into that, but we have all of our county agencies involved, whether that's EMD or uh, uh, environmental management group that's looking at what happens with contaminated soils and health and contaminated water, because you can't, you know, there's certain, it has to be potable water that's drinkable before certain people, do. but there is a major county effort going on that. The board of supervisors just had a briefing last week and went into a lot of details. So we can certainly send you that briefing or, a link to that briefing package if you want to understand all the various elements. But I think we had like six or seven different county um, departments that reported on what their piece of it was, including health and human services. 
So I'd refer you to that, Mary, for more information, but the county's doing everything we can within the funding limitations we have to work to and encouraging the state. One of the biggest things is in trying to get the federal government, FEMA, to agree to the individual assistance request that's been made. Uh, it was originally denied. Cal OES has stepped up and they've submitted like a seven page letter of the justification of why we should be granted individual assistance. And that's where the federal government comes in and helps people rebuild their lives who basically have lost everything. And that's usually from a financial perspective, but it can be in many different capacities, including you know, mental state and other things if they sense that that's one of the needs. That individual assistance is a broad spectrum. Right now, we don't have that. We've already submitted a letter to the president, the United States, uh, the POTUS, asking him to override FEMA's recommendation if they don't reverse it on appeal. So we're doing everything we can to try to encourage the right decision consistent with those victims for the the Caldor fire and trying to get them every level of assistance we can provide, whether it's federal level, state level, county level, doing what we can. So I'd refer you to that presentation package and we could, I guess, include that as a link to the minutes for this meeting. So, so it's out there. So you and other people will have access to that. Cause I think that's a, that's a very important aspect of what we're dealing with. Not only do we have COVID trauma, we have Caldor trauma now. So yeah, very good question. And thanks for that. Anyone else on Zoom before we come back to the people in attendance here in the conference room? Okay, yeah, please. And, and where is the microphone out there? Yes. Okay, great. You should see green before you start talking. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, I missed the first hour of the meeting because I was working and I'm really disappointed that I missed the Oak Ridge students presentation because I was really hoping to make it for that. Um, okay, good, good, yeah. Um, so I, and so I don't know since I missed the first half of the meeting if I'm, if I'm off the mark, but I did have a question. So I'm a therapist in Eldred Hills and um, private practice. And I have, um, I receive a lot of calls from, and there's a large population of people that, and I want to find out if there's currently resources or if there's a plan for resources for people who um, they do not qualify for Medi-Cal <clears throat> and they have health insurance um, but either they cannot find a therapist who accepts the insurance that has openings, or sometimes they do, but they can't find one in person, and they really want an in-person therapist, since so many are not seeing people in person, um, and they cannot afford private pay. I mean, not even at a reduced amount. They just can't, um, and so I do not know where to refer them to. I've sought out to other, you know, my professional groups and they have um, recommendations for lower fee places, but they really cannot afford out of pocket at all. So I don't know what to do. Well, I, I do, I do because all health care plans, including my, my, my division, we are mandated to address the needs of our population and mm -hmm. we have a complaint feels like you're not addressing my needs and I always feel that that's an important piece that people don't uh, use is to to be, to complain to their health insurance provider and to demonstrate that the health insurance provider is not addressing the need because I, I don't underestimate the ability to really be the squeaky wheel because you might find that there is an ability for the plan, even somebody like Anthem or Blue Cross, any of the private insurance or somebody is really going, it's, a, it's a, not an easy process, but if you really go through, because the dilemma becomes is that I, I don't, I know the low, uh, low, uh, low uh, fee, sliding scale fee uh, resources that you already are aware of. And yeah, and then there's still the population that falls to the gap. That's why I talked about, right? Behavioral health system of, of, of care. And that's a gap that I don't think we really have a solution for today. But in the meantime, I think it's important for those that are getting paid for providing services because you're, you're the people that are reaching out to you to, to get treatment are paying for the health insurance. And so the health insurance carrier should be able to know that their needs are not being yeah. addressed. Yeah, and we try so hard. We've done appeals and um, also, it just- yeah, and, and you're, you're right. I, ha I do have a suggestion. Um, my mother is a therapist and she was like, you can't do telemedicine, it doesn't work. And I'm like, I feel like we need to help it because there's no other option. 
So toss this out as a possibility. If there are therapists who are available, are these mostly adolescent or is this just is it across the board? But across the board, it could be adolescents or adults. I see, I get a lot of adolescent referrals, but. environment traditionally from an academic perspective mm -hmm. has been taught that in person is like really the only way you can do it, right? And then the pandemic hit, and I just think that we're, we're busting through some old ideas about mm -hmm. what it needs to look like. But I would, I would suggest to you that for people who feel very strongly that they have to be in person, I would suggest this. If there are therapists who are, have availability right now, to do it online, mm -hmm. I would just suggest and encourage, give it a shot. Reach out to the therapist, find out what the best environment would be. In other words, if we're gonna do it from a telehealth perspective, do you recommend that I am not in the kitchen, maybe I'm doing it even on my iPhone, so can we use an iPhone? I'm in such and such an environment and try. And have those therapists say, we're gonna give it you know, three to four sessions and see what they're willing to do. There are some therapists I know that are reducing their rate because it's not in person. And those sometimes those those face to face are even less time and it's less intensive because you're not dealing with waiting rooms, et cetera. And some are actually reducing their rates, some are raising their rates. But I'm saying I think maybe instead of that, I think that barrier exists right now still for some people. I think kind of breaking down and saying, give it a try. If there's availability, it is actually better than nothing right now. And you might actually find it works. And I would encourage that because to your point, I've been through that complaint process and it's laborious. And I think when people are tired and they're scared. It's really hard to go fight an insurance company. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, but right. it's another level. But even finding telehealth, I mean, everybody's so booked up. Yep. And, you know, I've, I used to just be private pay, and I do, I applied to a whole bunch of insurance panels um, about a year ago. Like Talkspace and some mm -hmm. others that actually access therapists from across the United States where they're doing telehealth. You might find someone in Michigan who's a fantastic adolescent therapist who can do telehealth. And how do they pay them? I mean, so what about that? Doesn't I don't know if that answers. You can, you can actually do the payment online, mm -hmm. and every therapist has a different relationship. Like for example, on Talkspace, so there's some amazing mm -hmm. online platforms. But I think should also be looked at as a possibility because we just don't have enough mental health professionals right now. They're overwhelmed, or they're or they're or they've quit. But you're right. I mean, I was trying to access one for my kids. It was impossible. So think about these online platforms. But there's some great options out there that are that are different. Really nice. Mm -hmm. Any, any, any suggestions for those that can't pay out of pocket? I think can't pay out of pocket looks like this, right? That's mm -hmm. an assumption that, you know, if the therapist is charging $150, $175 an hour, I think go into it with the assumptions about the barriers and walk in saying everybody understands this is unprecedented time. You can find somebody who's a relatively new and highly skilled therapist that is trying to get some more hours in that's willing to do a rate based on cash pay, and that can be negotiated with the patient. So I think make sure you're not presuming barriers that may not exist and have people walk through that process. That's what I would suggest. Okay, so it's a matter of looking for them online? Yep, Talkspace and there's some other- That will take low fee? That, that may, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just an approach. You're just saying, hey, this is what I need. This is what I can pay. What could that look like? And do, and do that work. But there's some, there's some great new platforms that, that geography doesn't have to matter too much. services which if they can accommodate you they will definitely try mm -hmm. the other thing she mentioned was cal hope and i don't know I if that's a kind that. of yeah I kind of or, uh, organization yeah. you want to make a phone call and, and you know basically tell them the situation and see what they recommend because yeah. that's the state level referral i guess in terms of how do we deal with not only covid related things right. but other similar right. items so. I, especially where you mentioned i i like you mentioning the online services that are available i'm sure cal hope has you know that uh, resource listing right. of those kind of right. places. So, and and it, it, it is a gap. It is a gap. It's a funny situation. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like ER doctors. We, we can't keep enough ER doctors busy either because some of them have decided they're not going to practice anymore. They've given up with all the COVID yeah. stuff. And so there's crisis in nurses. Of course, crisis all through our healthcare facilities, right? Whether it's mental or physical or other. So, Steve, you have something? Just a very direct question, just, just for clarification purposes. So we have the population of people that uh, under Medi-Cal, and we have the population of people that have health insurance. What about the folks that don't qualify for Medi-Cal, do not have mental health insurance? Does the county provide services to them? So we have some of our services under the MHSA funding that are able to address now, those programs, again, will have eligibility criteria. So would not necessarily be somebody uh, for 
Um, uh, yeah. Not if somebody sure. gets specialty mental health services right. from you, right. they're not Medi-Cal, they, they don't have private insurance. Can they? They have, we have, we have some room there. I, I you know, you There's know, eligibility requirements. You have well, to be, it's, so. you know, but we all live in a, in a world of having a budget. So, you know, it is, it's, it's, you know, our, our contract and our, for the behavior health division, right? Our mandate is to address the needs of the medical population, right? And but so, but not only the medical population. Not only the medical population. We certainly provide crisis services, and that's regardless of who you are. We are the ones that are going to partner to see if you really are that much in crisis that you need an intervention. <coughs> and we make that referral, right? Um, we will certainly under our MHSA funded programs. If you are presenting either child, youth, or adult with very significant and complex needs that make you qualify for our services, but you're not these programs that we have, but you're not a medical beneficiary. There are some programs where we can also open up the door for those that are not uh, co so, uh, covered to any insurance. Because if you have private health insurance, then you have private health insurance. I know. I'm talking about the folks who don't have private medical people generally refer to. Correct. Them. Correct. Correct. Thank you. We always have to be careful. You know, I want to make sure in the public meeting that it's understood that we, this is not where the Behavior Health Division has the funding to address those needs. The reality is, is that it's allocated for certain programs. Yeah. Della, yeah. So, um, years ago, there was talk of having with the county mental health about having navigators to help people navigate this system, which is really difficult to navigate when you're not in mental health crisis, you know? Um, so I was just wondering, and that gets back to that institutional memory question again and challenge, uh, where is that, the navigators? I think what you're talking about and not having been there back when, when that conversation was, right? So I don't want to make assumptions, but um, in some respects, it's, it speaks to where the county is currently looking at what we are, what we've moved to the hubs and how we are now looking at having the libraries continue to be that place of a resource for individuals that need support. And then having the staff at the library, because it's really it's now located in staffing by the library, know that they can connect to health and human services agency staff to identify, okay, so we, this person needs this, is saying that they need this, you know, where can we within the county resources uh, um, uh, refer that person to? Um, you know, it's ideally navigators. I remember we had the Behavior Health Commission uh, this this year spend a couple months on a special children's uh, behavior health system of care analysis, and that came up also as as a, a recommendation that really it's so hard for individuals in the community. Yes, you can call that access line number, but still it feels really overwhelming, right? And so to have navigators because our system is a system of care. It's not just one entity. To have these navigators that basically could be like holding the hand of whoever needs that service and walk you really through whatever you need until you land it where you need to land. Um, so it's out the requests and the ideas out there. We we have it on our list to look at how we could possibly build that as we build that system of care. So it's not lost, I want to say, but I don't think we at this point today have been able to really truly staff it right as as such as an ideal navigator position i think it's still reality and i i recognize that that individuals in the community feel that i don't even know where to go and how and how right. to get our resources so the libraries are the hubs at the libraries are a first step in the right direction are there sure. actual people at those hubs the it's, actual people sitting there not just brochures <laughs> right. Yes, it is the library staff that is designated to be that initial point person for people to say, this is, I really, I'm not really here to, to get a book, but I really want to, I understand that I can come here and learn about services that might be available and I need this. So, but it's not, I, 
in a very ideal situation, we would possibly even have a counselor sitting right there, right? Who could do that first engagement conversation about, oh, so let's you know talk about your stressors and your struggles and your difficulty sleeping or somebody from our social services department to talk about, you might actually be eligible for these kinds of support, right? So that is still something that we need to look at for future. Very good, I think we're ready to put a wrap on this. So Cindy, if you just kind of summarize what we're gonna to do to put the information out, it's gonna be in our social media, et cetera, but. Yes, if, if it's okay with um, your, uh, both of you, your presentations, yep. you will run and yep. you can put those out. That had all kinds of great information and links to um, the for the Calvary information. We have links to that too. So um, if you guys have suggestions of what you, act, um, anything else that you wanted, we'll add that too when we put up the minutes. So this, this is the start of elevating the discussion. There's been discussion going on for many years in various places and stuff, but it's really trying to bring things locally to what we can all do to help. Uh, and with the information that's available, how we get people referred to the right services, get to the right website. And if you're having a difficult time, what I'd suggest is you call our county health services, the number that Nicole provided and ask for assistance. Where can I go? How do I get assistance with somebody who I think is on the verge of going to crisis mode. How do we get them reviewed by the, the proper team, whether that our psychiatric evaluation team that works with our sheriff's department and our clinicians go out. Uh, we also have law enforcement that intercede on 5150s or something when someone is acting irrational to try to determine do they need to go to the hospital and have a required assessment done to determine their stability and what kind of treatment's necessary. There's all kinds of legal ways and tools to use. It, it's just every one of those is difficult. And the biggest thing I think is the stigma of, well, I don't have a problem, you have the problem. You know, that's not what this is all about. It's about make sure, making sure that you feel your personal mental health and state of health is good and the people around you is good. And if it's not, what can you do to improve that? Because it does affect attitude. It does affect the way you interrelate with people. And like Stephanie said at the very beginning, if you wake up mad in the morning and you're gonna go into attack mode, what can be accomplished by that? How is that gonna help resolve an issue that you have? Civility, talking to the concerns you have, proposing solutions, that's great, but if you come off at the beginning, mad and angry and threatening or whatever, that's not something that's conducive to being cohesive. The, the term Josh one, that doesn't bring us together. We've got to somehow find a way to set some of those things aside and really work together to find the best way to help other people or help ourselves, whether it may be. I mean, the national statistic that I have a tough time accepting, but I guess it's true, is that one in five people in the United States have a mental health issue. One in five, 20%. So I always get concerned when we have a board of supervisors meeting because there's five of us. And I, I keep looking around the room to figure out, is it me? Or is it me? Now, when we supervisor Heidel, we were talking about no, not having sleep. Right? Yes, right, right. It's just as <laughs> one of you had a cold or just as one of you, Absolutely. you know. Absolutely, and if you're feeling that way or somebody else is sensing, so, you, it's need, okay. you need to go yeah. see a counselor, you need some help. It's okay to not be okay. <laughs> well, and I will tell you as we wrap up, I just want to commend you, Supervisor. At all. I think these conversations need to become more frequent. Um, it's going to be important. We don't even know the lasting impact on our kids and our adults relative to this pandemic. We still have people, you know, 60% of Americans are food insecure, which means they can't rely on having three meals a day. It, we're at 60% now, and I would argue that's raising. We still have women out of the workforce because we're caring for children. So this is not over yet by a long shot. So I really appreciate that you that you created this meeting. I'm hoping your colleagues do the same thing in their districts. I think this is incredibly important. And this is an example of great leadership stepping up with what I would opine is a crisis. And so thank you. And thank you for allowing me to participate as well this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank, I want to thank all the participants. I thought this was I'm going to go back now and look at what were the next steps. How do we bring the information that was provided here and, and get engaged at that next level of cohesiveness and bringing things together? And that's going to be a significant challenge, but I, I think we're in that mode of doing it. And I think once the county decides, yep, we're going to put ARPA funds into this, maybe that's some of the focus. How do we make sure that those funds, which are coming from the federal government, are being used to the best of our advantage 
to deliver the services and the missing pieces that have been there in the past. Are we going to solve all the problems? No, but we're at least can make a significant, you know, improvement in some of those those areas that we know are deficient now. It's just how much and being able to measure it. And right. the thing with a lot of that too is sustainability. You get an additional surge of money. It's one time money. It looks great. Let's get the program going. Right. But how do we sustain that over time? Which is what the supervisors have to look at versus, you know, in terms of general fund allocations and how we, we we use the realignment funds and you know that's the creativity part of it is how do you keep it going once you get it started but i think it's definitely something that needs to be brought to a higher level and again i want to thank everybody who was here appreciate your comments if you have any uh thing that you would like to add you can email us uh, and i will just mention that um cedar burgess who's our, my healthy communities representative on our elder Hills community council has had to leave the area so effective uh, first of next year, calendar year, I'll be looking for a new leadership team member in the health and communities area. And jo Dr. Josh Elder served in that for the first year, year and a half, and then it became CETA. So now it's time, I think, to look to a different individual who wants to get involved with helping us here locally in El Dorado Hills and promoting healthy communities, which as we've discussed, mental health is a big part of that. So anybody who's interested, uh, contact Cindy or I, I'd be glad to talk to you about what it is. It's not a huge time commitment, but I think it's a necessary uh, outreach type of service where we have somebody local that we can refer people to. And that's the, the role that both Josh and CETA have served in the past. So put that out there is kind of the last statement. And again, thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the evening to help us and participate in this and we'll move on to the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.